means that he has to again check the oil clearance in the bearing to be certain that he hasn't removed so much metal that the clearance now exceeds specifications. In order to check the oil clearance, he's going to make use of this, lead wire. There's another possibility. He could also use a product called plastic gauge. In either case, what we're working with here is a compressible material, either lead or plastic, which can be placed in the bearing when it's assembled, then later removed and measured in order to determine the oil clearance. This is what our workman is going to do, making use of lead wire. So let's again join him down at the pump and see how he's doing. Since the check that we're going to see for oil clearance involves assembly of the bearing, the first thing the workman does before beginning the process is to again check the manufacturer's instruction book. What he's looking for here is to make sure he's aware of the various steps involved in proper bearing assembly. He also checks out the construction of the bearing so that he can proceed step by step in a logical process. After reviewing the manufacturer's instructions and checking an exploded diagram of the bearing, he's ready to begin assembly. The first thing he does is to locate the identification mark on one end of the top half of the bearing housing. Remember, he checked these marks during disassembly to be sure that he could reassemble things in their proper orientation. He then finds the mark which matches this one on one end of the upper bearing shell. After identifying the two marks, he can then assemble the top bearing shell to the top housing. First, he turns the housing upside down to keep from dropping any components. Then he places the shell in position in the housing. You'll notice he rolls it into position as far as possible and then uses a hardwood dowel and hammer to tap it into its final position. Remember, you should never strike directly on any of these parts with a metal hammer. He verifies that the bearing shell is in its proper position by rubbing his fingers across the surfaces to be sure they're even. Then he turns the upper housing over to install the two screws which hold the shell in position in the housing. So he removes the screws from the plastic bag they've been stored in, checks the threads to be sure that they're serviceable, then inserts the screws in the housing. Finally, of course, he tightens them up with a screwdriver. Next, he applies a coating of oil to the lower bearing shell in preparation for installing it in the housing. However, before installing the lower shell, some cleaning and inspecting are in order. He needs to double check that the seals and the oil slinger ring are in a good state of repair. He wipes off the journal for the bearing with a clean, lint-free cloth because any foreign material left in the bearing during assembly will affect the readings that he gets with his lead wire. So he wipes off the journal, and he also wipes off the mating surface of the bearing housing. After doing this, he applies a coating of oil to the bearing journal to ease bearing assembly and to prevent the possibility of scratching or scoring the bearing parts during the next steps. At this point, then, he's ready to install the lower bearing shell. He sets it in position on the journal using care to avoid damage to the slinger ring, and then rolls it around into position. With the shell in its proper position in the lower bearing housing, he then needs to lower the shaft into its normal position. This is simply a matter of removing the wooden wedges and block which he installed under the coupling to lift the shaft. So with the wedges and the block of wood out of the way, the shaft is now lowered down onto the lower bearing shell. Next comes the installation of the lead wire, which will be used to perform the oil clearance measurement. Now in this particular case, he cuts two lengths of lead wire, one to fit on either side of the slinger ring in this particular bearing. And we'll see exactly how they fit in the bearing in just a moment. He needs to be sure that the lead wire will be positioned properly and that it will stay in position on the bearing journal. So he applies some small dabs of light grease to the top of the bearing journal where he plans to place the two pieces of wire. This will hold the wire in position until the bearing is assembled. So after applying grease to the bearing journal, he takes one of the wires and sets it into position on top of the journal.
After setting the first wire into position, he repeats the same steps for the second. Simply taking the wire, verifying that it's straight, and setting it in position on top of the bearing journal. Now with the two wires and the slinger ring properly positioned, he's ready to place the top half of the bearing in its normal position. So he verifies that the top housing has the proper orientation and then lowers it into position over its studs. Now an important caution here, some bearings use gaskets or spacers between the two halves of the housing. This particular bearing does not. However, if it did, they would have to be properly positioned before assembly or else a false reading would occur. With the top half in position, he installs the two dowel pins, which are used to maintain proper alignment of the two halves of the bearing housing. They're first inserted and then driven into their final position by tapping on them with a hammer. With the two dowel pins in and seated, the only step left is to install the nuts which attach the two halves of the housing together, that is, to thread them on their studs and tighten them up. However, there's an important point to remember about the tightening of these nuts. They have to be tightened in a, to a specific torque value and in the proper sequence. Both the torque value and sequence are usually specified in the manufacturer's instructions. If a specific sequence isn't specified, then a crisscross pattern such as the one you see here should be used. This ensures that stress is applied evenly on the two halves of the housing. So the workman tightens the four nuts in the proper sequence and to the specified torque value he obtained from the manufacturer's instructions. Now the next step after this assembly is finished is to immediately remove them again. You'll recall the reason for the steps that we're watching is to compress the pieces of lead wire and then remove them and measure them to determine the oil clearance of the bearing. So after tightening the four nuts in the proper sequence and to the specified torque value, they are immediately loosened, again in a crisscross pattern to minimize the possibility of distorting the housings. And then the nuts are unthreaded by hand, removed, and set aside. After doing this, the workman withdraws the two dowel pins using the same steps that we saw earlier. That is, he threads down the nut on one dowel pin, which results in the pin being withdrawn from the housing. After the pin has been withdrawn from the housing by running the nut down, it can then be grasped by hand and pulled out of the housing and set aside. The same process is, of course, repeated for the other dowel pin. With both dowel pins removed, the top half of the housing can then be lifted off and carefully set on the table as before. This exposes the two pieces of lead wire, which have now been compressed to a dimension indicative of the oil clearance in the bearing. So the workman removes the two pieces of wire and carefully wipes them off with a clean, lint-free rag to remove any excess grease. He then sets them aside on a piece of paper he previously prepared so that he can keep track of the orientation of each piece of wire. He's going to perform measurements of these wires at several locations, and he needs to keep track of which location in the bearing each measurement represents. So after removing the wires, cleaning them, and setting them carefully in position, he then takes an outside micrometer in order to take measurements of the wires. Now first, he checks over the outside micrometer to be sure it's in a good state of repair and ready for use, and he also cleans it with a lint-free cloth. After he's done this, he's ready to begin his measuring steps. So he takes one piece of wire and he carefully measures its flattened thickness on one end. After taking this reading and double checking it, it is noted on the data sheet that he's using for this particular operation. Again, he makes sure that the number is noted and clearly indicated as to its location in the bearing. The same process is then repeated for the same wire except the next measurement is taken in the center of the wire. As before, this number is noted on his data sheet and noted in such a way that he knows the location in the bearing that this dimension indicates. He then takes a third measurement on this wire, now at the opposite end of the wire. 
and this measurement, as with the others, is noted on the data sheet. He continues to do this, taking three measurements on the remaining wire. Then he divides each measurement by two. The result of this division is the oil clearance in the bearing at that location, which of course must be compared with manufacturer specifications to determine if the bearing is still serviceable. So with that then, we've seen the steps involved in figuring out oil clearance by the use of lead wire or as an alternative plastic gauge. The procedures for plastic gauge are exactly the same as those we've just seen. 